Linda Moore Lanning, you uh, you wrote your memoir of your year of the year your husband was in Vietnam, and your memoir, of course, says a lot about your husband in, in Vietnam, but it, it focuses on your own experience, um, and uh, it's um, it's a great memoir. Um, Thank you. I mean, and the the first few pages, I thought of it as kind of like the beginning of a roller coaster. You know, the there's the, the first thrill and then after that you sort of ride the rest of the coaster uh and and the whole thing was great but i found the first few pages especially powerful um and that sort of set the stage for everything that that followed so i'm very glad that that you wrote the memoir um there may be other comparable memoirs out there i'm not aware of them right now um, but i'm i'm interested what what um what was it that motivated you to write the memoir in the first place. Of course, among Vietnam veterans, there are hundreds of memoirs. Um, as I just said, as far as you know, looking at things from the perspective of the wife, there are many, and yours is the only one I, I read. But so what was it that motivated you to, to write your memoir of, of that year? Well, I think in part it was probably because I was very involved in Lee's writing of his books. and. Um, because I not only I typed some of them because we were back in the um, pre easy computer days, right. but um, <clears throat> I also um, thought that there was just another side of the story that was missing. Because my year was very full, even though it was it would appear to be a whole lot less action. Mm. There was a lot of internal action. <laughs> there was a lot of in, uh, things that affected me. So. Uh, uh, and and nobody else was writing one. Yeah. And so I had access to an editor uh, at Random House through Lee's Books, and um, he was interested if I would write it. So I wrote it, and he bought it. But by the time he bought it, um, the interest in the Vietnam books was waning, and they didn't publish it. So this book, in particular, was is a story of a 23 year old, written by a 43 year old. Mm. And edited then by a 63 year old. Oh, really? And so yes. the manuscripts hung around for 20 years? Yes, yes. Oh. And um, I finally got the rights back to it, and then Texas AM University was interested in, in publishing it. Well, I'm glad so that. It was part of the, it was really hard to, as a 63 year old, to leave the 23 year old intact and not make her a little wiser or a little, a little more. Uh, Mm -hmm. mature <laughs> but I tried really hard not to do that I tried to leave her as she was now you had you, you, you quote a number of times from Lee's letters and mm -hmm. now Lee we, we both referred to Lee now this is your husband who who wrote a couple uh, you know based on his diary uh, he wrote a couple memoirs of his own and then also has written a number of other books and, and you, you mentioned that now in, in your memoir you quote your you quote Lee's letters to you a number of times uh -huh. Did any of your letters to him survive? Uh, maybe two or three, okay. but not many because they always destroyed them because they didn't want them to fall into enemy hands. Right. Didn't want and he also, they, he also wasn't going to pack them around with him. Yeah. It's in the jungle. Right. So <clears throat> he read them a couple of times and then destroyed them. Yeah. The right. They didn't, they didn't want the enemy to get those letters and then be able to use them as, as right. propaganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, he didn't want to carry him. Yeah, sure. Because I, I wrote, I think, 318 letters. So he would have had a pack full. If he'd saved them. You know, the the <laughs> letter number you said. Yeah, wow. Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just wondering, um, you know, what, what, what questions to, to start with. Maybe, maybe this one. And that is, you know, because of Lee's writing about the war, I suppose in a way, that kind of guarantees that you don't get to put Vietnam behind you. Um, uh, that's true. Yeah. But to what extent, even, even if those books hadn't been published, even if you hadn't done that work with Lee's books, and then you write your own manuscript, and, and then eventually it does get published, um, to what extent do you think it would have been possible to really put Vietnam behind you? I frankly th don't think it would have been. Uh, I think we uh, actually found a very healthy way to deal with it mm -hmm. because he didn't, uh, like a lot of men, um, 
suppressed or compartmentalized, tucked away, put away, never talked about, but that didn't mean it went away. Lee uh, used the writing of, I, I viewed it as a catharsis in a way, and besides he was trying to tell the story, um, the pro-soldier story. Mm -hmm. Because he was very proud of his men and very proud of the, of what they did. They did very they did well what they did. Yeah. Uh, but it was that part was not recognized at the time. Yeah, and and in his book, he, he in his, in his memoirs, he mentions uh, you know a few times that he doesn't have any regrets and and he feels like it's a job that had to be done. He he reiterated that uh, in my discussion with him. But one of the things I found interesting about your memoir is that your memoir seems more ambivalent. Ambivalent. Well, um, I, I said that would be very accurate, actually, because um, because I was an army wife, and it's as I said in the book, it's sort of like being a member of a family, mm -hmm. and you can say all kinds of things about your family members, but somebody mm -hmm. outside of the family cannot. So uh, I was quite open, much more so than most military wives are, quite open about my displeasure with the army. Uh, but that didn't mean I wouldn't defend it because yeah. I was part of the system, you know. So it is an ambivalent position to be in. And, and also I was ambivalent because Lee wanted to go to Vietnam. It was his choice. He could hardly wait to get there. So it was a little hard for me to be really mad at the Army when he was pushing them to send him. Yeah. But that didn't mean I wasn't upset about the way it was operated or the way it was done. So, yeah, there was a lot of <laughs> there was a lot of ambivalence. You're right. Well, yeah, I mean, um, one of the one of the memorable passages in your memoir is when, uh, you know, I mean, Lee in his memoir he writes about his eagerness to you know to get jobs with more responsibility and to advance in in his career. And I forget the exact details. You you could probably help me with them, but he he gets a you know, particular job that he wants, um, which means, though, if I remember correctly, that he's going to be in more danger. Yes. And, and, um, and his letter kind of indicates that he's, he's, you know, if happy is the right word, or he's glad that things have gone this way, uh, your reaction is a little bit different. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was furious. <laughs> I, yeah. I was furious. Yeah. I wanted him out of the field. I was, I was willing to, you know, I mean, I was willing to, Quote, give him his space to go <clears throat> do his soldier thing. Yeah. But then when he had done as much as anybody else did, it was time for him to get out of the field as far as I was concerned. But then that's when he got the company, which is what he really, really wanted. Company commander. But it, company commander, yes. Yeah. But that made um, for two and a half to three months more field time, meaning, com meaning combat time and uh, a lot more responsibility and a lot more danger. Danger, I mean, which is realized, uh, you know, because there's some pretty serious combat that comes, right? That, Absolutely. That. And, and he's an easy mark because all the radios are around him, all the antennas are always immediately around him. So, um, yeah, he was just asking for more trouble, and I thought we'd had enough already. When you look back on that, I mean... What, can you can you spell that out a little bit more? I mean, what did that look like at the time? He, let me let me tell you kind of what I have in the back of my mind because I know of a situation. Yeah, and this this has nothing to do with Vietnam, but just to kind of get get mm -hmm. to the question. I know of a situation where a man with uh, three young children and and a wife uh, put himself into an extremely dangerous situation mm -hmm. in which he assumed he would not survive. But there was a little girl who needed to be rescued. Mm -hmm. And so he resolves, I'm going to go rescue that little girl. But, but his assumption, though, is that he wouldn't survive it because, you know, the enemy, you know, in this case, it's ISIS shooting, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he, he just assuming he wouldn't make it. But he, had a, but he had a moral commitment that, you know, I've got to go rescue that little girl. Mm -hmm. Not more than a mile away, or his wife and his, and his three kids. And on the one hand, there's that sense of admiration, like, wow, I mean, you know, you, 
you did something incredibly dangerous to genuinely help another human being. Mm -hmm. But had you been killed, you know, the people in your family, you know, that's a, that's a pretty serious thing. And I can't just help but wonder, you know, you know, what will the kids, what do the kids think about that? On, that? on the one hand, there's the heroic thing, you know, dad does the heroic thing. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah, but what if he'd been killed? What about us? Does that resonate at all as you... Yes, yeah, it's part of that ambivalence uh, that you're talking about. And it's even complicated further with the Vietnam thing because he was not viewed as heroic. Mm. He was villainous and yet was doing what he... I mean, he believed in what he was doing yeah. because what he was doing was... Um, trying to protect his men. I'm not saying that he was out to save Vietnam because we weren't terribly political at that point in our lives. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't about politics. It was about um, the camaraderie with the men and his responsibility to the men. Yeah. So on the one hand, he felt an obligation to stay because he knew he was a good commander, yeah. uh, an obligation to stay with them, yeah. and yet he felt an obligation to come home. Yeah. And I understood his obligation to his men, but I thought maybe we were more important, and especially since he was not being viewed as heroic. <laughs> so there is that. That's a selfish, you know. That's my my selfish stand was, and you know, I, I get it, but that that's enough. But you're pregnant at the same time too. I'm sorry. You're pregnant when this is. Happening. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. That just and all the hormonal things as well as the. It was a mess. I was a hot mess. <laughs> So there is that feeling like, but what about us? Yes. Yes. 50 years later, almost 50 years later, as you look back on that, what do you, what do you think about it now? Well, it was important for him to go to Vietnam. It was important for himself that he go and do that. And um, I had the wisdom to know that he needed to do that for whatever reason guys do that besides just to get out of the house. Um, so I was willing to let him do it. And if somebody had guaranteed me that he could come home alive during that year, then I, I would have, I would have handled it just fine. I mean, you know, the deal was there were no guarantees. Yeah. And one of the really hard things that people, especially nowadays, don't really understand is that, um, when I got a letter from him that meant that usually meant that he was alive two weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. But in the in the interim, those two weeks, I didn't know if he was dead or alive. You mentioned this a number of times in your memoir that <laughs> yeah. now we can be sure that at least up until ten days ago yeah. he was alive or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 And yeah, supposedly the army would notify me immediately if, if something happened, but frankly, it wasn't always as immediate as people might have assumed, and. Hmm. Um, you just needed your own personal assurance, and the letter was the only way to get it. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, gov the government notifying you if something happened, and then there's that passage in your memoir where the government car... No, <laughs> yeah, car. yeah. And I forget exactly exactly how that goes. I talked with another uh, wife of a Vietnam veteran. She just had a heartbreaking story of, of one of those cars pulling up to the apartment complex, going to an apartment close by, mm -hmm. And she just heard the scream or the cry of the wife when she got yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can't imagine that. So you, you described that, um, you described when that, when that car came up. Um, but it was, if I remember correctly, it was lost or something? It was, uh, yes, right? it was for somebody else. But we didn't know that, of course, at the time. One of the things I thought was so interesting uh, that I discovered about myself, and it's a truism, how strong denial is. Because when I saw that car, my first thought was, oh, poor Susan. Yeah. Something's happened to Tom. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't go, oh, my God, they're coming for me. Not first. No, Susan is totally, yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's how strong the denial is. Even, when you, even when you know it's coming, uh, that, it, that there's going to be denial, it's, um, it's just overwhelming. Yeah, you mentioned Susan. She was a friend of yours um, that you mentioned uh, a number. Of, well, a lot of your memoir. Uh, she's she's part of it. Her husband's also in Vietnam. Yes. Um, my understanding is he's in a position that's not as dangerous as as Lee's, but not that it's safe though. 
Yeah. It's yeah, not, he was not in combat. He was um, working to help the Vietnamese um, with their rice crops. He was a scientist and a, uh, a journalist. And um, his job was completely different from Lee's, but he had great exposure. And probably the reason he, he survived, uh, I guess in, in many ways he had greater exposure than Lee did because he didn't have the support Lee did. Right. But they, the, the Vietnamese probably kept him alive because he was helping them. And right. true. Rice production, rice right. farming, things like that. Yeah. So, so you mentioned Susan. The, the the government car comes up, and your initial reaction is, "Oh, poor Susan." You know something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it was. I mean, it was several minutes. It was literally several minutes before it dawned on me that it it could be looking for me. Wow. And we watched it. I mean, it's a very, very vivid memory, mm -hmm. even today. Yeah. Um, to. Uh, <clears throat> to see that car going up and down the street and obviously looking for an address. And I simply couldn't move. I couldn't make myself go ask who he was looking for. I just simply could not do it. Oh, yeah. no, and we sat there the whole night waiting because the car came by about three or four times. And we sat there waiting the rest of the evening to see if it was coming back. Wow. It was terrible. <laughs> now, if I remember right, there was someone who asked you about it later. Oh yeah, the the uh, a neighbor that we hadn't realized even knew we were there uh, told Susan how glad he was that because someone in the neighborhood had told him that they were in the wrong block and sent them on their way, and he was so happy that it hadn't been for us and we didn't even know he knew we were, we were there. Mm. Now there is a there is a part of your memoir where you, you do talk about a, a wife whose husband was killed in the yes. Gale. Yes. Yes. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about, about that? I mean, um, just, I, I forget some of the details, but you learned about her husband's name was Mike. He was killed. You're interacting with Gail. Um, could you just sort of talk about that situation? Just sure. It was, it was um, a difficult situation because um, her husband, Mike, had been killed uh, just days before her baby was born. Mm. And when we found out he had been killed, I was eight months pregnant. And Susan invited her to come to San Francisco because baby by then was two months old. Her baby was two oh, months old. So Susan invited her to come to San Francisco, which she did. And um, now Gail and I had never been close friends. We were acquainted, but we Susan was the the king the the reason we were ever introduced. Yeah. And so um, it was a it was a very awkward situation because. Obviously, she had been pregnant the whole time. They had chosen to postpone R&R &R until after the baby was born so that um, he could see the baby. But he was killed just days before the baby was born. So she didn't even have the R&R &R situation that I did. Wow. And, uh, of course, I was getting ready for the baby to be born. Lee was still alive. Uh, it was a but for the grace of God, there go I kind of situation, and yet very difficult for her. I'm sure, because um, she was still very much in denial that he, he she she never talked about him in past tense. You mentioned it was very memoir. difficult for all. It was just eerie for all of us. I'm. It was. Um, it was just a difficult time. But this is kind of typifies the experience of being a waiting wife. Most of the stuff that happened was very internal. Mm -hmm. It was very real, and it was very. Um, sometimes traumatic, but it was mostly internal and reactions to situations and events as much as the events themselves. So yeah. her being, her, her um, and, and, she, and she went with Susan during the day to go sightseeing, which was a diversion she needed, and I understood that. Mm -hmm. So she left me to take care of the baby, which was fine, and I frankly, learned how to take care of a baby thanks to her because I was pretty ill prepared myself. Yeah. But um, uh, she was um, she was devastated, of course. She was devastated and was grappling to deal with it. And it was just a struggle for all of us. My impression from the memoir is that it was I don't I don't have the recollection of of you and Gail. You and Susan, I think, talked about the war a bit, and she seemed to be more openly opposed to it. Yes, yes that, Susan. That's my impression. Um, but I don't recall that you mentioned that you and Gail ever really talked about Vietnam. 
No, no. Uh, we didn't talk about Vietnam um, then or ever. Um, and most, as strange as it sounds, I was around the military for another 20 years after that. And I never had a conversation with another woman, another wife who waited through Vietnam. It was never discussed. Our, we never shared the experiences. Uh, there would be a, maybe a referral to what they did where they lived while so-and-so was in Vietnam, while the husband was in Vietnam, or while they were waiting. But there, we never, ever talked about the experience, even though we all sat there in the room having had it. It never came up. It was never discussed. And I can't tell you, I'm sure there's some profound psychological something there, but it, I didn't realize that until I wrote the book that I don't know if my experience was typical mm -hmm. or totally different because we didn't talk about it. Yeah, I mean, do you think, I mean, part of maybe from your perspective, maybe part of the reason there's not an attempt to reach out is that you're expending so much psycholo psychological energy holding yourself together. Mm -hmm. to, to, yeah. to do that would be to sort of breach the dam. Yeah, and there were, I mean, it, okay, it's been now 50 years and I can still, uh, there are certain things, certain phrases, certain events that just bring tears to my eyes instantly. I mean, there's just, there's still a lot of, I wouldn't call it residue particularly, but um, there's still a lot of things that prompt that without notice. And so I think it was, I, 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 I would say that I couldn't have written this book at age 24 or 25. It was too raw. It was too, I just couldn't have done it then. Mm -hmm. One of the themes of the book, and you just kind of touched on it, is isolation. Oh, very much. I mean, you know, these the, the very powerful, the, the whole memoir is great, but the very powerful first few pages, when you actually get on the bus, mm -hmm. you feel certain he's not going to survive, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah, and that's an, an ambivalent part, too. Yeah. I, I'm, sh I'm sure there was a part of me that, really didn't believe that he would get killed or didn't believe that he wouldn't come back. Yeah. Because I'm not sure I would have, I, I don't know, I guess I would have thrown myself in front of the bus if I absolutely totally believed that. But mm -hmm. I was, in fact, terrified that that was going to happen. Yeah. So I don't know how you square that, but that's sort of where right. my head was. It makes sense, but I don't, I don't have a, rele a recollection of anybody being there to console you. No, 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 no there wasn't. And nobody prepared us. Um, because in those days, and this is what a lot of people don't understand now, during the Vietnam era, the, the troops went, and officers, everybody went to Vietnam individually. They didn't go as units, by and large. Now, a few of them did, but by and large, they did not. Right. They rotated in and rotated out as individuals. And so, therefore, uh, all my friends whose husbands were going in the pipeline to go to Vietnam, none of them went when Lee did. Uh, right, yeah. And Susan Tom going within two months of Lee was really close by comparison. Yeah, yeah. So there, we didn't have any collective support. Uh, yeah. The military didn't want us on the post. Once our husbands were gone, we had to move even if we'd been living on post. Yeah. Um, there was um, there was absolutely no support. It was total. We were totally isolated and from each other and from society because, especially when live in a place like San Francisco, uh, it was, um, we were shunned, basically. We were shunned. You mentioned this a number of times in the, in, in the book. And so that's the question about the protesters that I, I, want, to, I want to come back to. I, I do have a sort of a, a question about this isolation. So you're there basically on your own, watching your husband go off. When he comes home, uh, Rest and recreation in Hawaii, things are organized. You describe yes. that pretty well organized. You know, you've got a lot of people waiting for their, you know, their military personnel to join them in Hawaii. But then when he comes home to California after his year, no, it's, it's to California, I believe he comes home to California after his year in Vietnam, mm -hmm. late at night, and no one's, no one is there. No, I was the only person who met the plane. Just this 300 and something men coming home from a year in Vietnam, and I was the only person. And I mean, okay, so maybe they didn't have the bands and the, you know, big to-do about it, but just the, the law of averages, you would think somebody else somebody. in the San Francisco area right. would have had somebody getting off that plane. Yeah. But I was, I was 
so traumatized waiting for that plane to come because I was sure I was in the wrong place and I was going to miss it. <laughs> you know, because there was no, there was no crowd. I expected a crowd to be there, and there was nobody, just me, at midnight, watching those people get off, watching those men get off the plane. It was, it was a very, it's a very, very vivid memory. Yeah, and and then you just mentioned, you know, a number of times you're at various events. Where's your husband? He's in Vietnam. Followed mm -hmm. by maybe a comment or an awkward mm -hmm. silence or something. What, what do you think for that generation, your generation, I mean, do you think that your generation has, I don't know how to put it, what, what do you think the long-term consequence of that has been, if any, I mean, maybe there hasn't been a long-term consequence of that, but, but do, do you think that this very divided world, you've got these 19, 20-year-olds, let me let me let me put it this way. I think Lee said that, you know, um, he he goes through obituaries as I do. Actually, yeah. so yeah. I've hit that stage of life where I start looking at. <laughs> but whenever I see men, especially men uh, in their late sixties, early seventies, the thing I always look for is military service. Mm -hmm. And when I see an apparently healthy man, you know, you know, healthy in life, you know, uh, who late 60s, early 70s, who passed away but did not serve in the military, there is always that little thought in my mind, like, well, why not? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. 19 and 20-year-olds and 21-year-olds, they're over there, you know, what were you doing? That, that's just sort of one of the thoughts that goes to my mind. Um, that, that division, that isolation, do you think that there has been some sort of long-term cost or consequence oh. of I think we're right in the middle of it. I still think we're very, very much attached to it. I think what we're going through right now is that absolutely direct. You could link it back directly. You mean the division today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because in my view, Vietnam um, is quite misrepresented. Or it has it. It, it was there were two faces of Vietnam. One was fighting the spread of communism in a little country in Southeast Asia. But the real Vietnam was the um, political, um, philosophical, whatever divide. And I view Vietnam as sort of like Gettysburg. People were not fighting over that little piece of territory in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It wasn't that important. What they were fighting over was who was going to be in control. Mm. And Vietnam was the same thing, I believe. Mm. You mean sort of a, a country split into general ideological camps? Yes. Or yes. And Vietnam was an excuse. That, I mean, if it hadn't been Vietnam, it would have been something else that they protested because the, um, the youth were in, and it was my generation, but not, not where I came from in particular, yeah. Yeah. but um, were in rebellion about... Um, the quote establishment about the government about all those kinds of things and um, Vietnam simply became the focal point the place to fight mm -hmm. fight it out yeah. I think and, and, and the division we, we see then is directly related in retrospect and clearly see it you, you mm -hmm. see that as kind of getting us to where we are now yes um, because era. the protesters were the people who stayed in school. The people who stayed in school became attorneys, they became teachers, they became administrators, and then eventually they took over the school system with that philosophy that they had. Yeah. And um, they then taught our children. Yeah. And I think you'd find it, and, and they became university professors. And I think you could find a direct linkage, by and large. And so I think Vietnam was there was a military part of it, which, which we won, which we excelled in. We beat them. I mean, we defeated them every single time militarily. Yeah. But the real, the real big, bigger picture war was over the philosophy, the, the direction of the country, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that in retrospect, at 23, I just thought they were cowards and they were wrong, and they were just avoiding doing what they should do. Because I came from a place where you 
you did your time, you, you served, you whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you've kind of answered the, the next question I had, but I'll go ahead and pitch it again, but I'll, I'll, I'll preface it by saying, uh, overall, I'm a pretty tolerant person. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I see photos of the, the hippie protesters, mm -hmm. there is something um, that uh, I just have a really hard time keeping down. And I actually tell my students, you know, I, I try to be as even-handed as I can. Mm -hmm. When it comes to this particular class of people, it's extremely hard for me to do it. Understanding what a tough war Vietnam was and what a complicated war it, it was, mm -hmm. and understanding why people would be opposed to it. I just have a really hard time, though, with, well, even the phrase I have in my mind, with 20-year-old spoiled brats. You know, yes. got it easy. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I've expressed my view. Uh, when it was, as, as you look back, what is... What is as you look back now, I mean, what are your feelings about, because you, you mentioned, you know, protesters. You're in San Francisco, which, of course, is a, a tough place to be if you're, in, if you're a military family. Oh, yeah, I couldn't have, couldn't have picked a, a more controversial place to be, frankly. Yeah. As uh, I, I think now, part of the reason that I have a reaction that I do to the, quote, hippies and the flower children and the, all of the protesters and all of that is because I thought most of it was very disingenuous. I thought most of it was very dishonest. Most of those, people, those guys simply did not want to go. They did not want to have their lives disrupted. Yeah. They didn't want to go get shot at. They didn't see any reason they should get shot at. Yeah. They, did, they, they, they were protesting, on the one hand, their, their parents' um, superficial quest for money or whatever it was. Yeah. But they were really used to having that money. And they really didn't want to do without that. They didn't want to get. They didn't want to sleep in the mud and the dirt. Yeah. I mean, and I can I can understand that. Yeah. And frankly, during that year, with all the things that happened, like um, Ted Kennedy driving Mary Kill the picnic off the. Oh right. Yeah. I mean, he was supposed to be. He was part of the the government that was taking care of Lee, right? Mm -hmm. And then then we then I I mean I was totally unprepared for what kind of scoundrel he really was because I didn't have any frame of reference before that. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. well, on the one hand, I couldn't understand Susan and her, um, her anti-war stand, and it was made especially hard for her because her husband was there. But I came to, I came to appreciate that more and more as, my, as I discovered more and more about how, how things were really run. You, yeah, you mentioned Ted Kennedy and his involvement with the, um, the young woman. Apparently, he was driving drunk, and they went mm -hmm. to the river, and she drowned, and he fled the scene. And yeah, um, you know, it's a really tough time. You also mentioned, you know, the Manson family, all that. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was on. a very eventful year, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's not long after 1968, which of course is a, 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 a very tough, tough year as well. One of the things that was interesting about your memoir is my sense from your memoir is that your perception of Vietnam at that time was just sort of this thing that was making your life miserable for a year and you know, <laughs> yeah. it didn't really have any meaning beyond that. Right. Um, I think you've touched on this already, but as you look back now, it's, again, it's hard to believe. I mean, almost 50 years since Lee went. Um, what does the Vietnam War mean to you now? With the with the sort of the broader perspective, you've done a number of books and things like that. Well, that's it's a difficult a question to answer simply because while Vietnam was not the cornerstone of our relationship, it was a cornerstone of our lives mm -hmm. because it had such influence on both of us. Uh, because I I. I changed a lot during that year as well, and that experience, yeah. and uh, as much as he did, uh, just in different ways, but not not apart, but just different. Yeah. And so, and then with his writing, I mean, his, he talked about Vietnam all the time, unlike what a lot of people do. Now, it was many years before he wrote the books, but he, he never didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was part of his catharsis, too, was just to to process it, I guess, over and over and all the time. I mean, he didn't dwell on it. It wasn't a fixation. It wasn't a, 
anything abnormal. It just was part of his experience, and he talked about it. Yeah. So um, it was always with us, and then then we got into the books, and then um, it's. I guess it's finally not with us quite as much, <laughs> quite as much, just because. Um, Everything wears out pretty much after 50 years, <laughs> so it's some of it, some of its yeah. potency is is perhaps gone, but it's still very much part of our lives. Yeah, just sort of that uh, that continual presence. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you been to the 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 Vietnam Memorial in Washington D.C.? I have. Do mm -hmm. you remember what your first reaction was to it? Well, I had reactions even before they did it because of what well, I had a. a a lot of problems with who they chose to do it and mm. what it was. Uh, I didn't like the idea that it was going to be black. Mm. I liked the concept that everybody's name was on it. Um, I didn't like the fact that it's dug into the earth. It's like a scar on the earth. Mm. I don't like the concept of it, but it is very powerful. It yeah. is very powerful. And so all of my preconceived notions could very well just have been wrong it may have been the best way to do it because it is very powerful it and it, you know we we went and we looked at all the different all the men he listed in all of his letters we the ones he lost we we found their names on the wall yeah so it is very is very powerful i still didn't like it i don't like the concept of it but i will do not deny that it is very powerful it is yeah I, yeah I, I think it's uniquely powerful among the, the memorials in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I, I don't disagree. You know, one of the things that sort of, um, and I guess there was no, no way, many of war, the war memorials um, celebrate or recognize, honor, whatever the word is, the heroes of that war. And, and Vietnam had no heroes. Mm. So it's appropriate that everybody's mentioned, and everybody's mentioned equally, yeah. and that's all well and good, but it left us with no heroes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a society without heroes is a society in trouble. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I, and that certainly describes the world we have today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, it's interesting going back to what you were saying a bit that you know Vietnam was what it was. It's a it's related to the Cold War. It's a struggle against communism in this particular place. It's a desire to you know help South Vietnam to stand on its own and, and be independent. And it's such a such a, a complicated thing, but it certainly does seem to get wrapped up with a lot of other cultural things that are going on that are, yes. that are with us. One of the things you, you asked me, you know, it still affects us. Uh, one of the things I learned uh, as a result of Vietnam, not not when it was happening, but later, um, it was a McNamara who said that um, we were never going to win that war mm -hmm. as long uh, until we had a stable government in Saigon. Yeah. And we never got a stable government in Saigon. Right. And so every time still today, I'm dealing with a problem that I just can't get my, I can't get, it's like, I can't find the, the problem. I remind myself that, okay, we don't have a stable government in Vietnam, in Saigon right now. And until I get to the root of the problem, I can't fix the rest of it. So and that's that's, we can never fix the rest of it because we did not ever solve the root of the problem. I agree with you. My, my my sense is that was the fundamental thing. You never yes. got a government in Saigon that the people of South Vietnam right. could trust in. Fight for. Mm -hmm. Consequently, would fight, be willing to fight for mm -hmm. and, and, and die for. Well, just, a, just a, a couple other questions. One of the things that struck me as interesting, early in the memoir, I believe you're on the plane, and, you know, you grew up in church, that's my understanding, and so mm -hmm. you're praying. Um, now, this is the time when I think most people would assume that, you know, your, your spouse, your husband has just gone off the war. So this is a time when prayer and faith is more important than ever. But you describe 
I mean, almost instantly, sort of your youthful uh, um, faith uh, in God just sort of draining away. Um, yes, it evaporated. <laughs> yeah, and could you just, just I mean, discuss that a little bit? And, and I mean, do, do you, as you look back on that, do you know what, can you kind of explain what that's about? Or have you ever figured well, out what that was about? Um, it was about... Um, Let me see how I can best describe this. I grew up Southern Baptist, mm -hmm. and frankly, life was pretty simple. Pretty much, we lived in our community based on the Old Testament much more than the New. It, the farming and all that stuff relates more to some of the plight in the Old Testament. Yeah. And things were pretty black and white, and, you know, I grew up in a small town, and it wasn't that I, I mean, I went to college. I'd been, I, it wasn't that I hadn't ever been anywhere I had. But um, when I tried to, I actually didn't, I was unprepared for this to happen to me. It was when I was on the, the plane flying from San Francisco when I just left Lee to, to put him on the plane to, to Vietnam, um, flying to, San, to Los Angeles. And I just hadn't ever flown into Los Angeles before. And I just had no comprehension for how many people that were there. Mm -hmm. Because I was very wrapped up in my prayers for Lee to get Lee home safe and, and very felt very connected and very direct. And then I began to see just how many people were down there in just this one town, in this one state, in this one country, mm -hmm. all of them praying to God for whatever it was that they thought was important. And I'm going, oh, my how, how my prayer is going to have a chance to get through. You know, I mean... I just felt so insignificant. Yeah. In 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 my needs were I mean everybody else's were just as important as mine. You know, it's just sort of so the the concept I had had of God really just sort of evaporated into the clouds up there. And especially because this was the the days when with the planes weren't ready the gate wasn't ready, they just kept the planes in the air. You know, and so we circled Los Angeles for about an hour. Yeah. Over and over. And I mean, I could see exactly how big it was and get some feel for how many, many people were there. And it just didn't square mm -hmm. with where I came from. And the God I was worshiping, you just really couldn't handle that demand. Mm -hmm. You know, my, 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 my perception of God was pretty limited. Let's put it that way. It wasn't that God was limited, but my perception of God was limited. Yeah, yeah. And so, so then I was, I was devastated by that because I had counted on being able to, you know, pray that God would take care of Lee and, and trust him to do that. And so I was unprepared for this uh, unraveling of beliefs that happened. Now I didn't become um, agnostic or uh, an atheist or anything. It just, it just wasn't there anymore. Wow, and, and that didn't mean I didn't live by its tenants and didn't. Sure, yeah. it just it just was it was just one more support system that crumbled <laughs> when I needed it the most. Yeah, well, it's interesting because if I remember correctly, you mentioned that near the beginning of the memoir, and then I don't think it comes up again. No, um, it didn't. No, I sort of, I sort of, um, I. The closest I came to prayer after that was I sort of. Uh, long before satellites were the thing, and I sort of beamed my thoughts up into the wherever, hoping that Lee would get them or that he would that he would take care of himself. It was I didn't ever. I mean, I wasn't a hypocrite about it. <laughs> I didn't have it disappear and then pray to it. I just was without it. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So, so I'm not asking you to be a theologian. I'm just interested. <laughs> In your response, um, you know, actually, I mean, I will say one of the things when I began interviewing combat veterans 20 years ago, mm -hmm. my assumption, you know, because some of my first interests really did have to do with sort of the spiritual lives of men in combat, mm -hmm. and my assumption going in is, oh, well, life and death is, you know, on the table every day, and so of course these guys are going to be thinking big thoughts and praying a lot and thinking about eternal questions. 
And really the biggest surprise talking to most combat veterans is how little that actually comes up. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's actually the rare veteran who, who really talks about that in a convincing way, you know, like they mm -hmm. like really made a strong spiritual connection during my, my time in combat. Um, it's almost like that stuff just, well, the way I think of it is, you know, if, if a basic definition of hell is the absence of God, then that phrase, war is hell, really makes sense. And in some mm -hmm. sense, in the combat situation, it's like at least the Western Christian Southern Baptist Convention, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. conventional ways of thinking about God. Doesn't it's it? a problem with being raised Southern Baptist is the first thing they teach you is that that's the only way you can't ever believe anything else. Yeah. Or any other way would be wrong. And so, yeah. where, I mean, where, if that falls apart on you, then where are you going to go? Because you've been taught you can't go anywhere else. <laughs> nobody, yeah. nobody else has the right answer except them. Yeah. Well, when you so to get to the question, I mean, I'm just interested in your own personal reaction, just sure. sort of what thought goes through your mind. Or so, for example, you hear combat veterans speaking, firefight, leads in these situations. Some of his guys don't make it. He does. Mm -hmm. um, you ask the veteran, you know. Why do you think? Why do you think you made it, and the guy next to you didn't? Um, or somehow that question comes up, and the response is, "Well, God was protecting me." Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm just interested in what what goes through your mind. Probably you've heard that sort of thing over the past fifty years. Well, one of the things is probably something Lee said when we were in Hawaii on R and R. Uh, he said the night we sat in the bar and he really talked and described how he felt and what was happening to him and and um, all those things. One of the things he said was that in every case he was aware of, when somebody died, it was somewhere up and down the chain, somebody made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so I think rather than placing my faith in God to take care of him, I just hope to hell nobody would make a mistake, especially him, because he's a little on the arrogant side. So uh, I didn't, I just wanted nobody to make a mistake, and that's, that was my yeah, yeah. frame of, frame. that was my thought from then on, from R&R &R on, was just don't let anybody make a mistake. Yeah. And so if somebody else, you know, if somebody else makes that statement, well, you know, God is protecting me, and that's why I survived that battle. Mm -hmm. Your response is just okay. That's your way of thinking it through and processing it. And, and I don't, and I don't quarrel with that because it certainly may have been. Sure. And just the fact that you believed it may have been why. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't, I don't quarrel with any of that. Sure. And it's not that I don't have. I, I'm not um, big on organized religion. Yeah. But I, though I do think we have. I think we were better off when we had it mm -hmm. as a society. Mm -hmm. um, even though I didn't necessarily agree with all the tenants, um, I, I think it was pretty healthy when um, when we had God as the cop, if you will. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they're people, maybe they're afraid of their parents, but you know, if you organizing know, the hey, God will get you. You know, that's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. And I think yeah. we, I think we all behaved a little better when that was out there. Vietnam kind of did that in too a little bit. Yeah, it did. It did. The error of Vietnam did. Yeah. Um, just here's a. I think I think it's the last last question I I have. Um, and that is, you know, you you find out fairly fairly soon, fairly early in Lee's year in Vietnam that you're pregnant. Yes. Um, I think you touch on this a little bit in the memoir. I'm interested in your response. Um, you know, I imagine, you know, obviously looking at it as an outsider, I thought, well, okay, so what might the responses be to the news? I'm pregnant, mm -hmm. my husband's in a war zone. And of course, this is a time when, you know, being a, a single mom is much less common than it is now yes. and, yes. Uh, and much more difficult than it is now. Although I'm, I'm sure it's always difficult, but I think even more difficult then because of cultural disapproval right. and things like that. So I, I, I thought, well, maybe there might be one of, you know, maybe two, two general responses 
Um, one is, wow, I wish I weren't pregnant because if Lee doesn't survive, then I have the burden of being a single mom. Mm -hmm. You know, in at this particular moment in American history, and that's that's an especially tough thing to be. That might be one response. Another response might be. I'm glad I'm pregnant because if Lee doesn't survive the war, at least I have something of him yes. in the child. Mm -hmm. Which of those resonate, or maybe you had other thoughts that, that came to mind? I'm interested in. Oh no, it was it was total and complete. The second one, I never I never had a single thought of regret at all. Um, I was thrilled, mm -hmm. and now my parents weren't, and his parents weren't. You but his mother that. didn't think she could get everybody home and have a grandchild. I mean, it was just too much. She just thought it was too much to, too much to ask that everybody be okay. Um, and my parents, that the, the your first option there was what hit them first was that if anything happened to Lee, I would have a hard life or, or I'd have hardships because I would be raising a child alone. Yeah. Um, I never thought that at all. First of all, I had a college education. I was not going to be destitute even if I had a child. I mean, I, I would take I'd take care of it. I mean, I'd figure out a way to, we'd have a nice life. It, that didn't occur to me. I mean, Lee and I had dated for six years before we got married. And we'd been married for just over a year when he went. So it was very important to me that I have this child. Mm -hmm. That I have our child, um, so it never. Now I know I, I I do know this much. I do know women who said they, the day they found out their husbands got orders for Vietnam, they went to the doctor to get the pill. Really, yeah. I do I do know that, but I was not one of those. Yeah, I I was hoping to be pregnant before he left. I was disappointed that the test had shown that I was not before he left. But two weeks later. Uh, the doctors confirmed it. So, uh, just in the nick of time, I think. Yeah, well, <laughs> just, well, just in the nick of time. But uh, no, I never, I, I've never had a single regret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned that dorky joke, the doctor, that you had the, the doctor told you that you had the Egyptian flu or something. Oh, yes, yes. You were yes. I, the doctor told me I had the Egyptian flu. I was going to be a mummy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought it was terribly, terribly clever of him at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you mentioned your your degree, and and at the end of your book, you you know you mentioned uh, you know that you held a number of different jobs, and and one of them being a university administrator for yeah. a time, if I remember. Um, yes. Yeah, I was vice president at the University of Phoenix for a while. Yeah. 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 Well, what well, I, had a, I had a very checkered career, um, and I, frankly, uh, I did all the things an army wife is supposed to do, but I wasn't very good at it. Because I'm too entrepreneurial and too, um, I just was, that was not my best role. Uh, and and I quarreled with the Army a lot during the, the 20 years that Lee was in it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, after I went into business, I began to understand and appreciate the wisdom and the structure of the way the Army does things, because they get it done. Yeah. And... Um, they move people in and out of slots, but everybody's getting knows what the role is there. The business world moves the slots around. Oh, so okay. it's a little more confusing in my view, in my view. Yeah. But no, I came I came to be a very strong fan of the military mm -hmm. and the way it gets things done. And I'm I'm defensive or protective of it, if you will. Sure. Uh, because um, and also. I think we've another another result of the Viet, of the Vietnam era is that we don't most people in this country don't really appreciate the importance of having the military. Mm. They think it's just that it's a given that everything will be just fine even if we don't have a military. Yeah. In fact, I would say if you took a vote in general public, especially the young people, they would say just get rid of it, stop spending the money, or just get rid of it. Yeah. They don't understand human nature, and it's that hello, there would be people on our shores. Very shortly. Well, yeah, and I tell my students if you if you like having the clothes you have and all the stuff that comes mm -hmm. to this country on ships, 
then uh, you need to express some gratitude to the U.S. Navy, which more than any other institution keeps the shipping lanes open mm -hmm. right. and free uh, around the world. No, I, 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 I um, identify very much with, uh, with, with what you just said. Just, I guess this will be my, my last question, and that is, if you were to suppose, you know, put yourself in front of a, a group of 30, 20-year-olds today, mm -hmm. um, and you have a minute or two to say, here's what you need to know about the Vietnam War, about mm -hmm. that era. So not necessarily, obviously, tactics and all that stuff, but just mm -hmm. about that era. Mm -hmm. uh, based on your own experience, Lee's experience, your experience together, what, what would you tell them? Um, I would tell them what I told my friends at the time. The Vietnam War was about, it, it was just very personal. It comes down to the war is about what's happening to the person. Mm -hmm. And in my case, the person waiting at home. Um, now, there's all kinds of political complications and ramifications of the Vietnam War, but war itself comes down to you're going to survive it or you're not, and your 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 person over there is going to survive or not. You know, it, it it's just that simple. Yeah. And war is I, I get very <laughs> very um, frustrated, I suppose, with people who think that we can go to war and not have anybody get hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just incongruous. Yeah. Um, and I know even when Lee, w Daddy said to me one time when we were driving cross country, that he he didn't he helped Lee survive for all kinds of reasons, but he he didn't want me to be bitter if if he didn't survive. And I said wow. the only reason I would be bitter was is not that he went and did what the country asked of him, but the country didn't put every resource make every resource available to him. Now, if the <clears throat> if the army had dedicated every plane they had to Vietnam, every bomb, every shell, every cannon, every everything, and we and we still got beat, well then, shame on us for not being stronger, or we gave it the, our best try. Yeah. But to have my husband fighting in a war, to which we were not committed, mm -hmm. and nobody knew how to run it, we didn't have an end goal exactly. Um. And, gee, we didn't really want to hurt anybody or we didn't really want to defeat anybody. Uh, or it was, there was nothing clear-cut about it. And so for me, part, part of the flashes of anger I got occasionally was that they put Lee out there, but they didn't give him all the resources they had to protect him. Yeah. Just maybe just barely enough, and sometimes they miscalculated. And yeah. frequently they miscalculated. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, it, it's important that I've, already, I, I've talked too long to those young women now, <laughs> those young people. Sounds but fun. it's a compli it's a complicated error, and yeah. um, and we're not done with it yet. Oh, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. You know, I've said it before that um, the more I learn about Vietnam, the more memoirs I read, the more veterans I, I talk to, the more I teach about it, the more I visit Vietnam. I'm planning my my third trip to Vietnam now, but the easier it is to describe, at least from someone who never personally experienced it, but mm -hmm. at least as, as well as you can, the easier it is to, the more I learn about it, the easier it is to describe and the harder it is to understand. It just mm -hmm. like this endlessly complicated thing that you can't ever really get your hands around. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this last statement you made that, and it's still not over, I think that, that that, that, that absolutely is right. My own perception, and feel free to respond to this, my own perception is that, you know, a couple generations from now, when the personal memories of the war are gone, consequently the, the strong sentiments and feelings that are associated with the war mm -hmm. when those are gone, just because the people carrying them are, not, are no longer alive. Um, and, and a lot of the details sort of fade away. Um, I am hopeful that it will be recognized that, you know, there was something noble and admirable at the heart of this thing, and that was to give these folks in South Vietnam a shot. Mm -hmm. And 
I think even saying that, I can I can hear Vietnam veterans responding in all sorts of unhappy ways. But but I I, I do think that that is right. That at the heart of this thing, there was something noble and something admirable that we want to. We don't want to make a colony of South Vietnam. That's, that's not the goal. No. We, we want to help these folks. We want to give them a shot. And to me, the great tragedy is, as we already said, the government of that country was never, never got it together. And mm -hmm. consequently, the thing's just, just not going to work. But that's not on the vets who went over there and, and did, what, did what they were asked to do. Right. That's my perception of it. Yeah. No, the, uh, I think Lee's absolutely right that, that the troops fielded during that war were as good as any we've ever put on the battlefield. They did what, they did what was asked of them, and in many cases, having far less idea why they were doing it. Now, I'm not sure that, I, I don't think I view it as much as giving the people of South Vietnam a chance, a shot, which we were doing. Um, as much as it was to stop the spread of communism and the yeah. domino theory. Sure. Yeah. And I believe the domino theory absolutely was correct. Yeah. I and I, I do I do support that. Yeah. Um, yeah. now, at the time I sort of <laughs> it was a catchphrase. Uh, but in yeah. retrospect, I think that's what we were doing and I think it was a noble effort to because without somebody standing up somewhere to stop it, it was on a rampant and that's right. I think Vietnam is pivotal, but I'm I, I'm afraid that, um, like some survey stake that gets driven in the ground, that it's likely to get covered over how important it really was. Mm. I fear that yeah. because it was so controversial, nobody knows what to do with it. Nobody can explain it exactly and thoroughly. Nobody can make sense of it exactly and completely. So, just bury it in say, oh, well, that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. it, really, it really wasn't. No, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. Even, even the way you express that, though, gets at the complication of it, isn't it? So, well, Linda, I really, I'm glad you wrote your memoir, and I, I think that the first publisher you mentioned really blew it uh, by not publishing it 20 years before, but I'm glad, I'm glad that, it did, that it, it did get published. It's a great memoir. Thank and, you. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to... Uh, to uh, share your memories, share your thoughts. Appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you very much. I hope that um, at some point it will be important to somebody to help them understand yeah. a different perspective of the war. I do too. I, I hope the same. Thanks a lot. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. You bet. It's pleasant. Thank you. Okay.